Well, I'd like to welcome everyone to um, the first annual Little Egypt Math Week. And so this is our, our first attempt to expand Math Field Day to a whole week of events. And uh, we're very pleased uh, to have this kind of turnout to our first official event of Little Egypt Math Week. Um, before we begin, I want to thank, there's been a lot of work behind the scenes uh, for the various events this week, and I want to thank our office staff, um, Diane Fritcher and, and Nancy Bale, uh, Rachel Kubiak and Barbara Mueller, um, just uh, have done a tremendous amount of work for the events of this week. Um, Kathy Perichek Spector, the vice chair, who's uh, the chair of Math Field Day, um, is, has been working nonstop on things. It's just um, an amazing amount of work that goes into that. Um, I want to thank Andy Ernest, the, the previous chair, who actually made the initial uh, contact with uh, Professor Sarnak. And I um, wanted to thank him uh, for helping sort of set the stage for the events here. And um, finally, uh, and most importantly, I want to thank uh, Carl Langenhoff. Uh, Carl could not be here um, due to his health, uh, but um, uh, Carl Langenhop, who uh, was a professor in our department for, for many years, retired in the, in the late 80s, uh, has been extremely generous with the department. And, um, and it is his generosity that um, allows this lecture series to begin. And I want to say a few things about Carl. Carl's not here, but we're, we're making a DVD of this, um, of this lecture, and we want to make, uh, send it to him. And so Andy actually found a, um, something that Carl wrote, and it's, it made an interesting connection with Princeton, and I just wanted to recount some of that. It, um, Carl, of course, got his Ph.D. from Ohio State in 1948 and was at Princeton for a postdoc from 48 uh, to 49. And um, interestingly, in uh, 51, Al Tucker, who was the chair of Princeton and John Nash's thesis advisor, for those of you who know John Nash from A Beautiful Mind, Al Tucker was chair, and he and John Tukey decided to create a something they called the um, Mathematics Research Group at Princeton, and is actually at the uh, Forestville Research Center that's still there um, at, at Princeton. And Carl Langenhop was the first head of that of that research group. And that research group uh, uh, comprised um, Walter Gilbert, Paul Mayer, Don Blackard, and Frank Spitzer um, were all members of that research group. And it turns out Carl Langenhoff was the, the head of that initial group. I didn't know that until today. And so there's this very interesting connection um, with Carl, with the, with the Princeton group. And, um, and Peter told me that that group still exists, that the Forest Hill research group is still there. And so um, let me begin by saying that um, from his website, uh, it says, Peter Sarnak has made major contributions to number theory and to questions and analysis motivated by number theory. Uh, to this, I must add that he's also passionate about the idea that factoring is not hard, <laughs> as we, we found today. <laughs> so, we'll add that to your wiki page, uh, Peter. Uh, he received his Bachelor of Science degree from the University of, of Witzwaterstrand in 1975, where he met a young mathematics professor by the name of Nicholas Phillips, an emeritus professor here at SIU in theoretical computer science, who he credits for much of his initial interest in mathematics. That's nice to, a, a very nice compliment. Uh, professor Sarnak received his PhD in 1980 from Stanford University, where his advisor was Paul Cohen. He began his academic career at the Courant Institute of Mathematical Sciences, where he was an assistant professor from 1980 to 83. He quickly re, uh, advanced in rank and returned to Stanford as a professor in 87. He arrived at Princeton University in 1991 and became the Henry uh, Burchard Fine Professor in 1995. He was chair of the Department of Mathematics there from 96 to 99, and he became the Eugene Higgins Professor of Mathematics in 2002 succeeding Andrew Wiles. Among the prizes he has been awarded are the Lady L. Conant Prize from the American Mathematical Society and the George Poyla Prize from the Society of Industrial and Applied Mathematics. 
He is on the permanent faculty at the School of Mathematics of the Institute of Advanced Study. He is an editor of the Annals of Mathematics, a member of the American Philosophical Society, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, and a fellow of the Royal Society of London. On top of that, he's an engaging conversationalist. In fact, I have to recount the story. I picked him up from the airport uh, yesterday in St. Louis, and we were, we were talking, and he was so fascinating. We were talking about all sorts of interesting things. I realized at, at, the, at some point that I had um, gotten off the interstate at some random exit and was driving the middle of, of, of Illinois and I had no idea where I was. And I, I had done that because I was so, so fascinated by our conversation. And so I had to actually turn around and go back to the interstate to eventually come back to Carbondale. And um, he was very gracious. He, he said, oh, well, it's, you know, talking about interesting mathematics and driving is hard to do at the same time in the service. <laughs> So therefore, um, it is a pleasure and my great privilege to introduce the speaker for the inaugural Langenhop Lecture, Professor Peter Sarnik. Well, well, thank you. It's a great honor to give this first uh, Langenhop Lecture and to be here. I quickly realized yesterday that you don't have uh, you're very far from any highways, so the fact that we were somewhere far from a highway is not unusual here. Uh, in fact, I was saying that other than in South Africa, which is where I come from and where Nick Phillips introduced me to mathematics, uh, this is the furthest I've been from the highway in this country, I think. <laughs> anyway, we arrived here and I'm ready to give this lecture. And this lecture is uh, about circle packings on Apollonius and number theory, which is my main interest. However, you should all be able to follow at least the pictures. Uh, where was the thing? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so let me start, as I've learned from my, one of my daughters, that you should have a picture in a lecture. So that is Mr. Apollonius that you could easily get for yourself. Whether that's really Apollonius, I'm not sure. But when I saw the picture, I thought I had to put it up because his nose is very similar to mine. <laughs> I feel very ki great kinship with this guy, and I've always told my daughters who have a similar nose that we all have Greek gods' noses. <laughs> anyway, I doubt that's really him, but if you ask Wikipedia or one of those things, this is what you're going to get for Apollonius. He was a great geometer uh, from this period. He was interested in conics. He, termed the, he wrote the book on conics, and he termed things like parabolas, ellipses, and hyperbolas. And he was very interested in circles, and this lecture is about circles and tangent circles. So let me introduce you to these circles and the circle packings that will be the topic. Okay, you see here a quarter, a nickel, and a dime. By the way, these are supposed to be circles. Any distortion is your machine, not me. <laughs> so these are supposed to be circles. They sure don't look like it. So just, uh, and this doesn't look like it. Okay, so if you take this took me a good three days to find this denomination. I was looking in all sorts of currencies to find three coins which had a miracle. And it turns out the quarter, nickel, and dime have this miracle that I'm going to explain to you. But the question is whether they really have the miracle. I, I have got many responses from people who've read an article of mine where I asked the question, what is the true diameter that the, the US government thinks is the diameter of a nickel or of a quarter of a dime? because I'm going to be solving a Diophantine equation with the diameters. Maybe uh, there's some, maybe that's a bit better. I'm going to be studying uh, packings which emanate from this and whether you think that the diameter of, I think this is the quarter, is 24 millimeters exactly or whether they meant 24 millimeters point zero zero one. If you go to the official website, if there is such a thing, I looked at many different websites, you see different sizes. So eventually I rounded it off to the nearest millimeter. If I actually took the next decimal point here so that uh, what, what I'm about to say would no longer be true. So I'm cheating a little bit. This is the According to all the websites I've found, these are the three numbers, 24, 21, and 18, for the diameters of the quarter nickel and dime. Now, what is special about this is if we place them together so they're mutually tangent, in a moment, I'm going to give you one proof. I will give a complete proof of something. 
that if I have three circles situated like this, there's a unique circle, they are mutually tangent, doesn't matter where they are, this is a theorem of Apollonius, that's why we call this Apollonius's packing. There's a unique circle inside here which is tangent to all three. And the miracle that happens in this example is if these are, uh, these numbers here, 24 for the diameter, 21 and 18, then the diameter of the circle that you place inside here is also a rational number. You should be surprised. And that's what I had been looking for for a long time, for three distinct coins with this property. By the end of this lecture, you'll know what the miracle is and when this should happen. Anyway, that's a fact, and we will see why. Okay, so I'm going to, for the purposes of this uh, illustration, this is still supposed to be round, as you know. These are our three coins. I scale this up so that these numbers inside here will become whole numbers rather than getting any fractions, and everything will be whole numbers from now. The theory, the theory of Diophantine equations, the theory of numbers, is about whole numbers. And they are the hardest things to study, not the easiest things to study. It's very easy if you invent real numbers and complex numbers to solve any equations, many equations that you might want to solve. But to solve equations over the integers, Diophantine equations, is much more difficult. So I'm very interested in the Diophantine properties of these, and I'll give the history of this in a moment. If you scale by 252, that was the denominator there, and what you're seeing here is not the diameters anymore, but the curvatures of these circles. One over the radius. So that's all the curvature is, one over the radius. Since I'm going to fill in circles in these places, that's what the Apollonian packing is, the circles will get very small. So their curvatures, which are one over the radii, will get very big. It's better to look at the, the curvatures rather than at the uh, radii themselves. Now the other circle here has a minus in front of it. That's a convention to make a certain algebraic relation hold true a little bit later. And so I'm putting a minus in front of this. So this has curvature 11, the outer circle, which is tangent to these. And I'm putting a minus. All the other ones will be inside this, so there's an orientation. <coughs> And that sign is something we understand. So throughout this lecture, A of C will be the curvature of each circle that you see in a picture. And the miracle that uh, I'm going to describe is when we put the circle inside here or any further circles, their curvatures will continue to be whole numbers. So by this theorem of Apollonius that I promised to prove, in each of these loon regions, so we had these first four to begin with, they had whole numbers for their curvatures. I place new circles, there's a unique one that I can place in each of these loon or whole regions. And the miracle is that once these four starting ones are whole numbers, everybody else are whole numbers. So I'm just telling you the answer and displaying it with a picture. So we fill in these holes, these are whole numbers. Then we have these holes now to fill in, so we fill in those holes, they continue to be whole numbers. We continue to do this ad infinitum. That's a Apollonian packing of an integral Apollonian packing, the feature being, the surprising feature, that the numbers are whole numbers. And you might or might not find such a thing interesting, but this is the kind of thing that uh, mathematicians find interesting. They try and understand this pattern. So you fill this in forever, and I can ask you, and by the end of this lecture, I'll give you a conjecture as to what's going on, partially proved, which numbers appear there, which numbers are curvatures, in this packing. There are going to be, as you'll see, infinitely many such packings. This is my favorite one because it comes from these coins. And the kind of question that we will ask and that uh, the theory of numbers is about is, well, which numbers appear there? That's by far the simplest and most basic question. Are there infinitely many numbers here which are prime? Somehow that's always fascinated me the most. Are there infinitely many twin primes? Are there this is not about ordinary twin primes, numbers which are prime, which differ by two, but rather the integers that come up in this packing. So I want to dis analyze the number theory of this Apollonian packing and tell you why they were whole numbers and explain to you how this fits into modern mathematics and why this is a much, much harder than a problem than the, the more standard problem in the theory of numbers. And yet we can say quite a lot about it. So these are the questions we're going to try to study, and that's what I mean by an integral Apollonian packing. Now let me say a word about the history of this. The first person to discover this integral structure happens to be a Nobel Prize winner in chemistry by the name of Soddy. 
He was so excited by this, he even wrote a poem about this, about kissing circles or something. You can look it up. I'm sure you'll find it. Look for Soddy's poem on circles touching. He discovered, so before him, the Apollonian packing had been known for years. I'm going to explain to you Apollonian's, Apollonius' theorem. I always thought there was only one Apollonian packing. He discovered that over the integers, there are infinitely many Apollonian packings. And he discovered why these numbers are whole numbers. So it's quite remarkable. Chemist looks at this in the th not that long ago, well, 1936, but because he had a Nobel Prize in chemistry, he published this elementary number theory paper in Nature. <laughs> I think they would take anything he wrote, so this appears in Nature. Some of our mathematicians had not taken it and realized this integral structure, but soon people picked it up. Most notably, Coxeter wrote a lot about this. A very important paper for me and the one that is sort of a starting point, perhaps, is a paper by five authors, Bell Labs, we've been talking about Bell Labs, these are all from Bell Labs, Ron Graham, Ligarius, they were all at Bell Labs, Mellows, Wilkes, and Yan in 2000, who asked, I think, the right diaphantine questions and pointed in the right direction and developed some of the basic issues here, but from an elementary point of view. So that's an important paper. It turns out now that we can solve pretty much all the questions they asked using much more fancy mathematics. I'm not going to go into it. Modular forms, ergodic theory, hyperbolic geometry, additive combinatorics. I'm not going to go into these things. I just give you the kind of tools that are being used to answer this. I want to explain to you why this is a hard problem and harder than the standard problem. You might think this is a standard Diophantine equation. Okay, so I'll get to that. But first I want to explain Soddy's th fact that these integers are preserved, and everybody should be able to follow this. And so let me start with Apollonius' theorem, and I'm going to prove for you Apollonius' theorem, because Apollonius' theorem can be proved conceptually. If something can be proved by just without writing formulae or anything, I'm going to cheat a little bit, uh, then I should explain it to you. This is the theorem from the book. I mean, the proof of the theorem from the book, meaning I don't think you're going to give me a better proof of this. This is not my proof, it's a standard proof. So he has Apollonius' theorem that he had many theorems about circles, but the one that's very relevant for us in the very construction was that if you have three mutually tangent circles in the plane, then there are exactly two circles that are tangent to both of them that you can place, one in the inside and one in the outside, like you saw it over there. I will allow circles to be degenerate circles. So if a circle has infinite radius, it becomes a straight line. That's also considered a circle. And the reason that this is such a good proof is it brings out modern mathematics. We try to understand things by transformations, by geometry, in this case, by inversions. So if I have a circle and I make the transformation which inverts points in the circle, so what does this mean? I have the center of the circle, and each point in the plane, say this point P, will be moved to a point Q, which is on the same straight line uh, through the origin of that P is. And such that the product of the distance from P to O and Q to O, the product is the square of the radius of the circle in which you're inverting. So that's an operation of the plane into the plane. So this point will go to infinity. <coughs> infinity will go to this point. The circle will be fixed. The, cir the boundary will be fixed under this transformation. So this is a map from the plane into the plane. It's called a conformal map. You don't need to know. You just need to know this inversion. Now, I cheat a little bit. You have to go home and compute. I'm going to tell you properties of this, which I will not verify, but which are standard and which are, that's the computational part of this. And that is that if you, uh, if you have two circles, this will take circles to circles, this transformation. Any circle, its image under this transformation will be a circle. If two of them are tangent, when I've done this operation, they will still be tangent. In fact, angles are preserved. So circles go to circles, tangencies goes to tangencies. That's what's important here for us in this proof. So I now want to prove Apollonius' theorem. So I have my three circles. So we have C1, C2, and C3 are the circles. So C1, that's one circle. Here's C2, and here's C3. And I want to produce for you the unique circle which is tangent on the inside and the, t the unique circle which is tangent on that side. C and C primed. C and C primed over there. I take <coughs> any point which is like here, C, which is tangent to C1 and C2, and I invert about any circle for which C is the center. 
I don't care what circle, I just see what happens when I do this. So C will go off to infinity, this circle is tangent, these two circles were tangent and they will go off to infinity, that point will go to infinity. So a circle which was tangent to a point which went off to infinity must be now a straight line going through infinity. So C1, and you think about it, that's the only thing that can happen. C1 will go to C1 tilde, which goes to infinity. It may not be parallel, it may be facing at an angle, but that's irrelevant for this argument. So it'll look something like this. C1 tilde will be there, C2 tilde will be there, and C3 tilde is tangent to both. Now the only kind of circle that's tangent to two parallel lines is a circle placed inside there, like this. And now we can look for our two circles which are tangent to this line, this line, and that, we see them with our eyes. We put ourselves in a position where the answer is obvious. That's the circle, one circle which is tangent to both, and that's one, another circle which is tangent to both. We don't have to make any calculations. There aren't any others. All right, so in this position, the theorem is obvious. And now I invert back, and I get what I wanted. In other words, this property of being tangent is preserved. We're going down there, and I'll talk louder. What am I doing wrong? I don't think anything, but maybe just turn. He can, the recording one. I have a loud voice. If you can't hear me, let me know. I have a New Jersey accent, in case you were wondering. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's, that's a proof from the book in the, mean, in, the mean, in the sense that I don't have to calculate much. I think everybody should have followed that proof. We will need another theorem to explain Soddy's observation. And this is the theorem of Descartes. This is like the Pythagoras theorem. It's not as well known. Everybody knows Pythagoras' theorem. Apparently Descartes' theorem is much less well known. It's about circles, about four mutually tangent circles. It was written to Descartes, to a princess, I forget who exactly, according to the literature, in his attempt to uh, impress her. I don't know whether this got him anywhere. Um, uh, the main thing is Coxeter, who who became very interested in this theorem, found that it wasn't quite complete, his proof, that's indeed true. And then Coxeter gives three proofs of, that he's found in the literature, one he invents. But he bemoans the fact that none of these proofs are from the book, meaning these proofs all require some either very complicated calculation or some ingenious thing coupled with a calculation. So in fact, I don't know of the proof from the book, and apparently nobody knows the proof that will, you'll say there is no better proof than this. This is a notion of Erdos, the proof from the book means this is, this is the proof you will show a general audience. <laughs> so I'm not going to give you the proof of this, but let me state the theorem. It says that if you have four mutually tangent circles in the plane, which is what we started off with in our, four, our three coins plus one on the outside, we have four mutually tangent circles in the plane, they satisfy a quadratic equation. And any set of numbers which satisfy, real numbers satisfy this equation, actually come from a set of four mutually tangent circles. Be careful with the sign. This is where, if I'm the outer circle, I put a minus 11 in order for this equation to be true. So here's his quadratic form. We have four circles. Their curvatures are a1, a2, a3, a4. Then f of a uh, will be equal to zero. In other, and f is this exact quadratic form. This is a quadratic form in the four variables. It's twice the sum of the squares minus the sum of all the numbers squared. <coughs> it's a quadratic form in four variables. And every solution to this equation is uh, coming from four mutually tangent circles. This is over the real numbers. <coughs> Excuse me. And if you have four mutually tangent circles, the important thing to us is they must satisfy this equation. So that's Descartes' theorem about four mutually tangent circles. And um, this, this equation, f equals zero, defines a cone. The set of zeros of a quadratic form like this, which has signature 3, 1 over the reals, for those of you who know what that is, is a cone. So these points all lie on a cone. That's a statement about real solutions and real configurations of four tangent circles. Now let me explain to you Soddy's observation. Suppose I give you the four circles, which I'm, I'm, I'm going to prove that if your four, starting four circles have whole numbers for their curvatures, and I fill in those holes forever, the whole numbers will be preserved. I'm very excited when whole numbers are preserved. That's what, uh, that's what, the whole numbers, that's what number theory is about. So I want to understand this. And the reason is quite simple. So you take your four mutually tangent circles. They have curvatures A1, A2, A3, A4. 
Now, if C and C primed are tangent, so take, three, take any three of the four circles, say C2, C3, and C4, and I'm going to C1, C2, and C3, I'm going to play with C4. So for C4, F of A1, A2, A3, A4 must be zero. The circle that's mutually tangent to these three has its A4 satisfy this equation. By, they, by uh, Apollonius's theorem, there's a circle, another circle, C4 primed, which is tangent to the same three circles. So A4 primed, its curvature must satisfy this equation. So the first one satisfies this equation, this guy satisfies that equation. In other words, A4 and A4 primed, these are fixed now. Satisfy the same ordinary quadratic equation. So if I fix three of the variables in the fourth one, that's just now a quadratic equation. And you can use high school algebra to write down the solutions. Solution to a quadratic equation, ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero is plus minus b. Minus, okay, minus b plus minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. I didn't learn that from Phillips. <laughs> I would have known it better. <laughs> okay, so a, 4 and a4 prime satisfy an equation, and so you go back and you compute what this discriminant, the square root of b squared minus 4ac is, and lo and behold, it, in terms of for the first three curvatures, it's this expression, a1, a2, a1, a3, a2, a3. It's got to be symmetric. And so a4 and a4 primed, firstly, their sum is this number. The sum of the roots is, gets rid of this, this, this third, which we don't want to see if we're trying to make whole numbers, while the discriminant itself is this expression. And this discriminant, in the case of my quarter, nickel, and dime, these were the starting guys, to make the fourth guy a whole number, I need this delta to be, have a be a perfect square, and that's the miracle that happened here. That if you take these numbers, these three numbers, and you compute this number delta, this number's a perfect square, and hence you didn't ever lose the integrality. And also you learn Soddy's theorem immediately, and the Soddy's theorem was that if the first three guys have whole numbers for their curvatures, then, and the fourth guy also does, which is how we're going to make our construction, then, say, so these three are whole numbers, and if A4 is a whole number, then A4 prime, the, guy, the, the new guy that you put in, is also a whole number. So once the first four have whole numbers, then the new guy you put in has got a whole number, and then you do this repeatedly each time you put in a new circle, and you never lose the integrality. And that was this chemist's observation. Quite beautiful. So that proves for you that if the first four circles have whole numbers, the four mutually tangent circles which generate the packing have whole numbers for their curvatures, then forever you have whole numbers for the curvatures. That's the integrality in the theorem. Now, any physicist or mathematician will tell you everything is governed by symmetries in, in understanding things, and this is true here as well. There's a group which is governing the whole story. I'm going to call it the Apollonian group. And I want to show you this group is a tricky group, and it's precisely because it's tricky that this problem's hard in order to understand which numbers are curvatures in our packing. So this group is clearly around here. The group is this placement of a new circle in each loon that we were doing at the beginning, and now we actually have a formula for the curvature of the new circle in terms of the old ones. So this is this formula that I was telling you that preserves integrality. If these guys are all whole numbers, then so is A4 primed. So, of course, the sum and product of whole numbers is a whole number. That's a critical ingredient. And that transformation, which you saw over there, can be written nicely in terms of just matrices, familiar matrices. So this is, when I make this transformation, I don't, the, the A1, A2, A3 are not changed. But the fourth one changes by this linear expression. So one can express that by the following formula. Let me give you four four by four matrices. So these, I hope you all know what a matrix is. So these are four four by four matrix matrices with integer entries. If you square this matrix in ordinary matrix multiplication, it will be one. So these matrices, their inverses are also got whole numbers for their entries. So we're never going to lose whole numbers. We, we really want to keep this whole numbers. This is the heart of this. So we have four integral matrices, S1, S2, S3, S4, and they are four by, four by four integer matrices. And what we have shown here, and what is now standard, is that the curvatures in an integral Apollonian packing correspond exactly to an orbit. 
So this is what an orbit is. I take the group generated by these four matrices, meaning I take these four matrices and I multiply them and I form all expressions possible in the world with them. I just keep on multiplying them together. Whatever I land up with is a 4x4 four four matrix. I'll never disappear. I can't get out of the space of 4x4 four four matrices. I'll never get out of matrices which aren't integer entries because these are products of matrices with integer entries. They're inverses have integer entries. So everything is now going to be a 4x4 four four integer matrix, in fact, with determinant plus or minus 1. So the 4x4 four four integer matrices with determinant plus or minus 1 is just got this notation here, the general linear group of 4x4 four four matrices with integer entries. So this Apollonian group, which is the group generated by these four matrices, which you see over here, is a subgroup of this 4x4 four four integer matrices. This is a familiar group in mathematics. This Apollonian group is something strange. It's just the group generated by these four matrices. But it's the group that governs the whole story. It's the symmetry group of the Apollonian packing, of this integral Apollonian packing. We'll see in a moment the infinitely many. So A is a subgroup of GL4Z, and it's the subgroup generated by four of these matrices, and it's called the Apollonian group because it governs the Apollonian packing. All right, so what I said, what's there is what I said a moment ago, that any study of what are the curvatures in an integral Apollonian packing is no more, no less understanding this set here of this, uh, you take a four, your initial four curvatures, like we did in minus 11, 24, 18, and uh, 21, that's our starting guy. And we apply all the elements in this Apollonian group to that vector, and we'll get vectors in Z4. And these vectors will be all possible f mutual tangent vectors in Apollonian packing. So we've translated the problem from geometry to linear algebra with integers, so integral aspects of linear algebra. And also, by Descartes' theorem, all the points we will ever get will lie on this cone. They all satisfy f equal to zero. All right, so there's a group of symmetries here that is, this Apollonian group is a group of symmetries. I want to understand it a little better because it's controlling everything. And here, not all of you will have thought about quadratic forms which are not positive definite. You've all probably thought about the quadratic form x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared. And the group of motions of Euclidean space which preserve that the, sum, the sum of three squares is the distance from a point to the origin. The group that preserves that is called the orthogonal group. These are rotations of space. They preserve distance to the origin. We have a quadratic form, which was a Descartes form in four variables. It's indefinite. It's not definite, but that shouldn't bother you. And then the group that preserves that is called the orthogonal group of the quadratic form, just like the ordinary orthogonal group. It's just indefinite. And we're very interested in integers. So we take the Descartes form, which I called F. We look at all 4x4 four four matrices which preserve this quadratic form. That's the orthogonal group. And then our group, our Apollonian group, which I've just constructed for you, all the transformations in our Apollonian group preserve this quadratic form. They, they all stick you on the cone. So that's kind of has to be the case. But you can check it directly. And our Apollonian group is not only sitting inside 4x4 four four integer matrices, it sits in this intermediate group, which is the orthogonal group, the all matrices, 4x4 four four matrices, which preserve this form and have whole numbers for their entries. So you might not realize this group's very big and well understood. You've seen this group's big because you've seen the picture generated. <laughs> so it's there and it's big. But what's interesting here is OFZ is this bigger group and in ordinary mathematics, by which I mean modern theory of Diophantine equations, algebraic groups, this, the, the stuff we all like and work with, deals with this group. It does not deal with a group like this, which happens to be very small inside the big group. So the Apollonian group, which was born, if you ever want to understand the Apollonian packing or any Apollonian packing, is infinite index inside this orthogonal group. And that's what makes it, any problem about the Apollonian group fall immediately outside of the standard theory. And you have to invent new methods to try and understand questions associated with it. 
So let me give you, this is a public lecture, so let me put you a little bit in perspective here in terms of one of Hilbert's famous problems, Hilbert's 11th problem, which is about solving quadratic equations over the whole numbers. So, that, and that deals with this kind of group and any quadratic equation which is about all solutions, not something which involves something that's thin, as I call it, this Apollonian group which was born thin. So the Hilbert's 11th problem was only solved in 2000. Let me remind you what that is, because the problem we're facing is that much more difficult. <laughs> so you ask this very simple question about which integers are sitting inside there, and you're facing something that's already harder than the, the most profound theorems we know in the theory of numbers. And that's kind of, to me, very attractive. So the Hilbert's 11th problem is the following. It's a generalization of the following. So if you've never seen this, you can ignore everything I said up to now and listen because this is good. This comes from Gauss. It comes from Gauss. It's damn good. <laughs> Gauss was very proud of this. The day he proved this theorem that I'm about to tell you, he has an entry in his diary. He says, uh, Eureka, I've proved this theorem that I've been after for a long time. It's in his Disquestione Arithmetica. At the very bottom he says, by the way, my fifth kid was also born today. A very minor event <laughs> compared to this. So we see where his mind is. So, mankind has been fascinated for years about which numbers are sums of squares. So, which numbers are sums of three squares? Some of you might know that every positive number is a sum of four squares. You can write every number as x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared plus x4 squared. That's a theorem of Lagrange. But which numbers are sum of three squares is much more mysterious. Which numbers are sums of two squares, this Fermat understood. But three has always been quite difficult, and even today, Features of this we don't understand. Now there's one thing when you try to solve a Diophantine equation, that's a Diophantine equation by the way, if you want to solve this equation, the first thing you do is maybe there's an obvious reason you can't solve it because of parity. Maybe the right hand side's even, the left hand side's odd, then you're out of luck. <coughs> maybe the right hand side gives remainder 1 when divided by 3 and the left hand side not, then again you can't solve it. So you have to check what happens to the solutions in arithmetic when you look at remainders only, or modulo arithmetic as it's called. So it turns out that if you look at what happens when you divide by 8, you can never get a number, so if you give, give me a number which has got remainder 7 when divided by 8, so there are infinitely many like numbers like that, 7 plus 8 plus 8 plus 8, 7, 15, that, if you go on this progression of numbers which give remain seven, remainder 7 when divided by 8, you simply cannot be written as a sum of three squares. Why? Because if I look in the arithmetic mod 8 and I square all the numbers, 0 squared is 1, 1 squared is, is <laughs> 0 squared is 0, 1 squared is, yeah, I'm a bit out of it because of this long trip he took me last night. <laughs> 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 1 when divided by 8. And if you go through all the numbers, you'll get either 0, 1, or 4, and none of those three will add up to 7 when divided by 8. So no number which gives remainder 7 when divided by 8 can ever be written as a sum of 3 squares. And Gauss and Legendre, who were worrying about this, quickly realized that no number, not only, so if a is 0 there, then this is a number which gives remainder 7 when divided by 8. No number of the form 4 to the a times 8b plus 7 can ever be written as a sum of 3 squares. But other than that congruence, there's no further obstruction. This they understood. And so now you can see why Gauss shouted Eureka when he showed that as long as you're not of this form, you can be written as a sum of three squares. That's amazing. I mean, where did he find these three numbers? Well, that's math. He gave an ingenious proof of the existence of three integers, such as the sum of the three squares. He, he didn't construct them explicitly. He gave a proof that as long as you don't have this local congruence obstruction, as long as there's no reason you can't write it for obvious reasons, then you can. So this is as good as it gets. It's called the local to global principle. And this is the theorem of Gauss. I always thought it was Legendre. Then I look, Serre puts it's due to Gauss. Now Serre is very careful. Serre is very French. If he puts Gauss instead of Legendre, it's got to be a damn good reason. I had a lot of emails with him. And he eventually just said, well, they said that. So that wasn't very convincing to me <laughs> that he was just going by. He was being bullied by Andre Vey like many other people. Okay. All right. So the Hilbert problem was to generalize this theorem to any quadratic equation. 
Is it true that whenever I want to solve a quadratic equation, like which numbers are sums of three squares, or if you change a quadratic form, that's a miracle. Gauss had found one of the very few miracles in the world for which this local to global principle holds without any failures. So I will illustrate this. Uh, the Hilbert's 11th problem is really about solving such equations over number fields. That's how Hilbert formulated it. And the question, is there a local to global principle for, like which numbers are sums of three squares in a slightly bigger world? So if you don't know what a number field is, forget about it. Just listen here. It's just a more general equation. Uh, the coefficients lie in integers in a number field rather than ordinary whole numbers. And you still want to solve this equation. And you want to know, is there a local to global principle? And it was well understood by Siegel and Hilbert quickly that there is no local to global principle with, uh, in general. That you have to allow finitely many exceptions. And that's the theorem that was finally proved. The first breakthrough was Duke and Ivanich, 87. The complete solution is Kogdil, Piotrowski, Shapiro, and myself in 2000. And it concerns about sol the solution of a quadratic equation in three variables over the integers in any number field. And the answer is if you have three variables or more, you have a local to global principle, except perhaps for finitely many exceptions. And you always have finitely many exceptions. That's interesting, except if you these fields for this form. So that's the general picture, and why am I bringing that in? Is because in our Apollonian packing, back to our Apollonian packing, we have this Descartes form, which was a quadratic form in four variables. We're looking at integer solutions, so I'll just make a quick normalization here. This Apollonian group, if the four uh, curvatures, of, I'm back to where I started, so that was an aside about, I was putting this in a context. We're back now to the Apollonian packing. We have four mutually tangent circles whose curvatures are a1, a2, a3, a4 as part of this packing. And what I want to point out to you is those must satisfy Descartes' equation. So f of that is zero. They lie on the cone. Now suppose I take any such a which, for which the greatest common divisor of these four numbers is one. So they have no common factor. And I look at the orbit of a when I multiply by these matrices. I like to multiply on the right by <coughs> um, four by four integer matrices which are in this orthogonal group, that'll preserve this cone. This orbit will be the entire set of points. In other words, when the group is the full orthogonal group, we're picking up all solutions to this equation f equals zero with a side condition of being primitive, which is a minor thing. And if we then want to ask on the cone, is there uh, the first coordinate? Remember the coordinates in the four vector are the curvatures. So if I look at the first coordinate and I say, is this coordinate a curvature of some Apollonian packing? I'm looking at the full orbit group. Then I'm looking at uh, equation f equals zero. I've fixed one of the coordinates at some integer value. And I'm asking in the other three variables, can I solve that equation? That's a quadratic equation in three variables to be solved over the integers. And I'm telling you there's a local to global principle for that. That's this Hilbert problem. So if I, my group was the big group, this would be Hilbert's problem. And we have barely put all our knowledge together to solve that problem. Many contributions by many people leading to the final solution. So in that case, we do know which numbers would appear on the full orbit. But the Apollonian packing is about the orbit of this a, which was generated by just these four inversions, because that's how we made the Apollonian packing. So we're looking at a problem which is exactly like Hilbert's 11th problem, but much more difficult because the group, we don't know even who's in the group. We only know who's in the group if you generate the group by these four transformations. So I, I think that puts it in the context of why this is such a hard problem. All right, now I want to tell you the answers. We know what's going on. We know conjecturally what's going on. So I'm now, you, you couldn't have ignored everything I said. The main thing you want to walk out here is which numbers are curvatures there, right? I'm going to tell you the answer, conjecturally, and what we know. So the techniques <coughs> that are normally used in the theory of numbers to solve equations involve counting. That's a very powerful method. <laughs> Gauss, I didn't tell you I solved this. Gauss was a, just a brilliant, this, he just did high school algebra, just a brilliant guy. I mean, he just writes down formulae generates the answer by some miracle there. He wrote, he, he showed the number of ways you can write that a number as a sum of three squares is equal to some other quantity that he knew was not zero, as long as you pass the local obstruction. 
So that's very special, this case. The proof of the general Hilbert <laughs> 11th problem involves automorphic forms, L functions, subconvexity. You don't want to know. You just want to know it's true. So one of the key tools is counting. So you could ask, how many circles are there in my packing or any Apollonian packing whose curvatures are less than x? Okay, so let n p of x be the number of circles in the packing whose curvatures is less than x. That's a finite number because the circles get very small, their curvatures get very large, so they're only finitely many. This is going to show you why this problem is a little weird and why the pictures are so beautiful. Because this is connected with fractals. This is what's going on here, and this is why this is not fitting into Hilbert's picture. We, we, we have fractals. But that's the nature of the problem. <coughs> so David Boyd, using completely elementary high school geometry, was able to prove the following. That there's a number delta. It happens to be the Hausdorff dimension of the Apollonian gasket. So what is this exactly? You take these circles that you get in this packing. You remove all the open disks in that packing and you're left with a closed set which is some weird Cantor-like set and you ask about what's its dimension and it turns out it has a dimension which to a few decimal places we know that to a few decimal places is about 1.305 it's very important for me that the number is bigger than one the exact numbers of course nobody knows the exact dimension of that but it exists and Boyd showed that the number of circles whose curvature is less than x grows like a power. So if you take a log of that number divided by log of x, I'm looking at the power growth of the number of these, of these circles, grows like roughly basically x to the one point, x to the delta. This is completely elementary, quite remarkable that you can do that with no machinery, just by estimating the circles as you generate new ones from old ones. It turns out there is an asymptotic formula for the number of circles whose curvature is less than x, but this already uses some very interesting hyperbolic geometry and eigenfunctions and spectral theory. So I don't think there's an elementary proof of this. This is due to Kontorovich and O. Alex Kontorovich, who got his PhD at Princeton. He, O, who's at Brown. She's at Brown. Um, and that's that Boyd's theorem can be elevated to an asymptotic formula. So Boyd was just giving the log of this divided by log of x goes to delta. This is the strongest statement. It'll be crucial. The constant b happens to be related to some eigenfunction. Uh, so if you ever gave an elementary proof of this, you would be reinterpreting something that is quite fancy in terms of uh, elementary terms. So my suspicion is that this is not easy to prove elementarily. But the fact is the fact. This has an asymptotics. So this is the first thing because we might want to produce primes, we might want to count and do inclusion-exclusion, we might want to run some analysis and solve Diophantine equations using some techniques and the counting is always necessary. All right, now when I described Hilbert's 11th problem I said not every number is the sum of three squares because a number which is, gives remainder seven when divided by eight is never a sum of three squares. Is there some congruence obstruction in our problem here? Yeah, maybe some of these curvatures have to satisfy some congruences. Well, I'm sure you all noticed they are. And this is something we can understand. This is group theory. Number theory is hard. Analysis, everything's trivial except number theory. <laughs> That's the philosophy if you want to do number theory. So everything's trivial. But when you try to solve over the whole numbers, it gets hard. So I, I'm sure you all noticed, but it wasn't so obvious because you couldn't see in that picture and they weren't round anyway, that all the curvatures in my packing satisfied this congruence. They are one of these, <laughs> one of these six numbers modulo 24. Okay, that's a theorem of Elena Fuchs, also a Princeton thesis. And that's the only obstruction. So that, like in, in uh, Gauss's theorem, you weren't allowed to be of the form for 8a plus 8b plus 7 times 4 to the a. This is the only obstruction in congruences. And this, what's interesting, is for the Apollonian, for the, this thin group A, which I'm telling you is very hard to deal with. So she determined all the congruences. So this is a finite statement. It's much easier than a global statement about saying, does a curvature appear as a number? This is only whether a curvature appears when you do arithmetic, looking at the remainder modulo, uh, 24. So this is quite remarkable that we know exactly what the congruence obstruct. Uh, this has to be satisfied. So 
Let me not go into the proof because I don't want to introduce any sophisticated, unnecessary notions to. So in the paper of Ligarius et al., this Bell Labs paper, they asked the question whether the set of numbers which are curvatures is of positive density. They already knew that the numbers which are, don't obey various congruences, not exactly this, they weren't quite as this, they weren't as refined as this, but they knew that some numbers are omitted. So they asked some simple question, which they called the positive density conjecture, which was solved by Bogan and Fuchs <laughs> last year, using techniques that I will come to at the very end to say a word about the techniques which we've introduced for this problem. So they show that the set of numbers which are curvatures, so look at all the numbers up to x, all the whole numbers which are curvatures in this packing. Not all of them are curvatures, but there's a positive proportion of numbers that are curvatures. But now I come to the real answer to the question. Just like in Hilbert's uh, question and in that local to global principle, we believe, and the numerics I'll give you in a minute is very convincing, is that there is a local to global principle here. That is to say that the numbers have to satisfy the congruence that they are congruent to one of those six numbers when divided by 24. That's a necessary condition. We claim the belief is that that's also sufficient as long as you allow finitely many exceptions, which we always have to allow, and there always are exceptions. That is to say that if you wait long enough, you look at all numbers bigger than some sufficiently large number, then every number there which satisfies the congruence will be the curvature, and those are the exact numbers. In other words, those are the, 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 there's a very simple answer to the question. They are numbers which satisfy that congruence and are sufficiently large. We call that the local to global conjecture, and that's the conjecture which is exactly the analog of Hilbert's 11th problem. But it's formulated for something which the usual methods can't apply. Here's a numerics experiment of this. I say the numerics are convincing. Actually, they aren't, but I'll convince you that they're convincing, even though they aren't. So that's, I guess, like uh, all scientists, they'll have a lot of <laughs> outliers, and you say, I know why they're there. Ignore them. <laughs> so here's a, this is probably the better one to look at. So we look at the numbers which are congruent to 13 mod 24, and we look and all the numbers which are congruent to 13 mod 24 in between 10 to the 8, I think that's it's supposed to be an 8 anyway, it doesn't. 10 to the, 4 times 10 to the 8 and 5 times 10 to the 8. They've gone very high, far. And there are no exceptions. Every number which has, satisfies this congruence, they do find a circle and there's a curvature with a, with a congruence for it. In some other, these congruence, if you're congruent to 12, it's supposed to be true, but they're still finding at 10 to the 8 that there are 536 exceptions. We understand this well enough why this hasn't kicked in yet, and we can't really, they're, they're not professional calculators. This was an undergraduate thesis <laughs> in Princeton. So I asked her only to go up to 10 to the 8. I didn't want to try convince my colleagues that we can't have email for a few weeks while we run this program because <laughs> this is more important. We could argue scientifically that this is convincing enough. If you took other packings, everything kicked in. So it looks like the local to global principle is true. And that's the main conjecture that remains unsolved. But there is some very beautiful progress recently and I want to describe it to you and then say a couple of words about one or two of the methods just generically and stop. So this is a theorem of Kontorovich and Bogan just being written up now. I haven't seen the details. I know the general outline. It's based on tools that I'll show you in a minute. And that is, they haven't solved this local to global conjecture. That would be just stunning. Even in the Hilbert case, it's very hard to prove that. So whatever, if they could solve in this case, they would have a completely new treatment in that case. But they can prove the following, which is second best. We believe that Every sufficiently large number which satisfies a congruence is a curvature. That's the conjecture. They don't know how to prove that. But they can show that every sufficiently large, the set of numbers which fail this property, the set of numbers which are bigger than some fixed number that they can write down. So once you lodge, the set of numbers which fail the conjecture, so these are the set of numbers for which the congruence is satisfied, but they're not curvatures, which is supposed to be the empty set. They can show the set is small. <laughs> it's not the empty set. They would have solved that if they proved it was an empty set. They show it's zero density, which is a very good start and I think quite a remarkable theorem given that we have so, such weaker tools in the setting. 
So they show the set of exceptions to the local to global conjecture is zero density in the sense that if you look at their number and divide by the total number of numbers you're looking at, that tends to zero. This, the, set, the exceptional set has zero density. This is still a far cry from the complete solution, which is the exceptional set is empty once you go far enough, which I'm sure is true from the numerics. Well, the techniques that are solving these problems also allow you to sieve. So let me just tell you a theorem that uh, I proved a few years ago in this connection, which partly started this, and that was of great interest to me. Uh, I looked at these pictures and wanted to prove there are infinitely many circles whose curvatures are prime. Are there infinitely many pairs of circles, tangent, both of whose curvatures are prime? We can call them twin primes. And the theorem is yes. So this is a clean theorem. There are infinitely many primes in any inf integral Apollonian packing. There are infinitely many twin primes, I like to say, just so that I can say I. Here's a theorem. There are infinitely many twin primes. I would love to say that it was about real twin primes, but it's about curvatures whose circles are prime and tangent. So it's quite remarkable that you might be able to say things as strong as this when you don't really know who's in the orbit. And the reason we can do that are a few techniques. So I just uh, want to end with that. I gave a lecture today to the colloquium today uh, explaining what an expander is. What's really interesting is there are many tools which are standard that go in. Sieving, uh, modular forms go into this, arithmetic groups, everything is involved in this proof that we sort of know. But then there are new tools, and the new tools are not coming from algebra or algebraic geometry, primarily because we don't know that we don't, this, this, uh, this uh, orbit was born with this Apollonian group, the symmetry group, which is infinite index in all the elements. So we don't have a characterization of who's in this group by an equation. It's not the ordinary Diophantine equation kind of problem. It's a geometry problem which has a Diophantine nature. And the tools that are being used come from computer science, believe it or not, theoretical computer science, the theory of expander graphs. So it's a remarkable fact, and I won't define an expander graph, but if we go back, if you followed up to this point, and I hope you've got some idea, maybe I'm hoping <laughs> at this point. Uh, then this Apollonian group, which I've emphasized three or four times, is very is infinite index in here. It's very thin in all the transformations which preserve the Descartes form. So it's infinite index. It was generated by four inversions which started made our uh, Apollonian packing. We can look and this is what Elena Fuchs is doing, we can look at the images of this group when we do arithmetic modulo Q. So we can look at the group generated by this and we can look at the image when you do arithmetic modulo Q. And as far as that goes, the group, what you get, except for finitely many Qs, is what you expect it to be. So we understand this image and that's what Elena Fuchs proved. She, that's how she got this, these numbers in arithmetic modulo 24. That was the only congruence problem. So that we understand, and it's part of a general theorem. But there's a much stronger property that we need to prove here, and which is the workhorse of all solving these Diophantine equations and doing any kind of sieving. And that is that if you make these graphs, so let me end with this, you make a graph out of this Apollonian group. You take the Apollonian group, you look at what you get when you do arithmetic modulo Q. You take these matrices, you reduce them modulo Q. You now get a finite group and you look at the graph whose vertices are the elements of this group and whose edges are these four transformations that have never changed throughout this lecture, these four four by four matrices. And these graphs have the properties of being pseudo-random. That's way of stating this. They are like random graphs and that's something we can prove using ideas from complexity in computer science. And it's the first time that those ideas, as far as I know, are giving us a lot of feedback into solving Diophantine equations. So this is a very beautiful example of where this theory of thin groups that I had spoken about earlier today is, was developed in order to prove these kind of theorems. The local to global principle, except for a set of zero density, the existence of primes, and ability to do sieving. So if you're going to go away with something from this, you saw the picture, you saw the proof from the book, I'll summarize quickly that, that you can prove Apollonius' theorem just by inverting in a circle. Once you have that, you have the notion of the Apollonian packing. 
It's a little more subtle that once you have an Apollonian poking, you start with four of them, which are whole numbers that will be maintained. That's Sadi's great insight. That comes from the formula that gives you the new curvature from the old curvature. It doesn't lose integrality. And then all the questions, Diophantine questions, that then immediately follow become these questions. And the most interesting question remains unsolved. It's the local to global principle. I have here a final slide, which is uh, references of uh, many of these works. Perhaps if you want to read something, you can read my monthly paper. I can tell you, you mentioned I'm an editor of the Annals. The hardest paper, hardest journal to publishing is the American Math Monthly. So I put a paper in there, boy did I struggle. <laughs> they make you actually spell out things in English. They actually make you write and not make mistakes. Wow, uh, the Annals you can sort of do whatever you want. Uh, so <laughs> this is the paper. So if you want to read an account of some of this, which is written, oh, which is written, uh, I think, for uh, undergraduate, you can read this monthly paper. I'm very proud that's my first paper in the American Mathematical Monthly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> And there's Soddy's paper in Nature, as promised. <laughs> uh. Any questions? Yeah. The fractal dimension that you mentioned. Yes. Is that, um, is that unique to the set of, pro of problems? Because when I was first visualizing this, I was seeing fractals. Clearly, analogies with other, with what I still remember from fractal geometry. I was just wondering if that number has other. Okay, that number is unique. It's associated with the Apollonian group. So if you make different Apollonian packings, uh, there's only one, let me just point out something, because I was very confused about this 10 years ago. Or, not I wasn't confused, because I was just ignorant. <laughs> there's only one Apollonian packing over the real numbers. So when this fellow Ligarius, who wrote about this with Ron Graham, came up to me one day and said, you know, there's an interesting problem which, in which this theory of thin groups, where I now call it, could be very useful is the theory, he said, in integral Apollonian packings. I said, what are you talking about, integral Apollonian packings? There's only one Apollonian packing. There's only one packing of Apollonius. That's true of the real numbers, meaning if you have three mutually tangent circles, which is how you're going to start to make your packing, right? You can move any three mutually tangent circles to any other three mutually tangent circles by uh, transformation, which is like my inversion, something called the Mobius transformation. So to a complex analyst or to a real somebody who works with the complex plane and is not interested about whole numbers, there's only one Apollonian packing. And that's what I always thought, there's the Apollonian packing. Then he pointed out to me that if you're working with whole numbers, there are infinitely many Apollonian packings, as I've just demonstrated, that Soddy discovered. So the Hausdorff dimension of the limit set of different Apollonian packings is the, the same. That's a number that's universal to the group to the Apollonian group. It's got many definitions, but it's not the same Hausdorff dimension or the fractal dimension as problems that come up in other uh, geometric questions. So it's a number that's associated uniquely to the Apollonian group, and it governs all Apollonian packings. So all Apollonian packings have the same asymptotics for the number of circles in the packing whose curvature is less than x. But the constant b, Remember uh, O and Kontorovich's theorem that said that the asymptotics of the number of circles whose curvature is less than x is b times x to the delta. That b depends on the packing. That's packing dependent. The exponent is universal, depends only on the Apollonian group. So the Apollonian group is the, is the real thing here. It's the symmetry of the problem. It can be viewed as a Galois group for this problem. And it, it, it reinforces the theory that group theory, symmetries, dictate all beautiful pictures like this and all the answers, in fact. But the Apollonian group is a thin group, and it introduces fundamental new challenges if you want to solve a Diophantine equation connected with it. That's the sort of the moral. And the, and the upshot is we have some weak substitute for the big major tools, <laughs> allowing us to say weaker statements and some non-trivial statements. 
Um, of course, these are completely elementary questions. This is one of the great beauties of number theory. Is you sh I hope you all understood what the question is. Which numbers are curvatures? And the beauty is that it's not like a fancy theory where you have to learn the fancy theory to solve the thing. There may be other ways of solving this problem. So that's the way we understand it now. Some of these questions may be much easier than, I can ima than I'm imagining, but I don't think so. So since the answer to some of the questions has this, like the asymptotics of he, O and Kontorovich has this constant B, and that B has a meaning in terms of some vibrating drum in three dimensions, it would be quite remarkable if you gave another interpretation of that number. But it's not out of the question. Yeah? The young person who wants to do that might want to get started on, might want to begin by trying to find the proof of Descartes' theorem from the book. Yeah. I ch that, okay. So, uh, Coxeter couldn't do it. I'm not particularly good at this. So, the question is, I stated Descartes' theorem. Coxeter has a nice article in the monthly. He was very good at getting <laughs> articles in the monthly. <laughs> He's a beautiful writer. So you can find a paper of his, which is referred to in my paper, which is, uh, he gives three different proofs of Descartes' theorem. Remember, Descartes' theorem was that if you had four mutually tangent circles and their curvatures are 1A, 2A, 3A, 4, then this F of these four numbers is zero. That's elementary geometry. You could have given this to a high school student, but they'll start making a lot of constructions and it'll take about five or six pages. A good high school student will probably get it. Now we're talking about the proof, a proof from the book. That means a proof that is good and it's minimal calculation. We're all lazy. We, we, we want to just think and say the answer is clearly this without any calculation. You see how clever I am? That's the proof we're looking for. So he says, why don't you start by trying to find the proof from the book of Descartes' theorem. I would say we don't have it. And certainly, uh, if you look at uh, Coxeter's treatments, uh, he bemoans us. So he's got a very ingenious, one of the proofs is very ingenious, but it still involves quite a bit of calculation. The proof I give in my paper <laughs> involves two pages of calculation. Otherwise, it is from the book. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this mod 24 uh, is true for all these packings. If you change a problem slightly and you can make many other packings and many other, you can go to higher dimensions with spheres, the actual congruences will be modulo other numbers. So there's nothing special about 24. What is universal is that any problem like this with a thin group which is gotten by generators uh, in versions or finitely generated group in this way, of, ma of integer matrices, there will only be, this is a general theorem of a, a guy called Weisfeiler, there will, only, there will be a, one number, Q, which will capture all the congruence of information. In other words, this is not an infinite process that you have to worry about infinitely many congruences. So a, a group will never fool you at infinitely many primes, so to speak. So in each case, you have to compute this let's call it ramification number, which is 24 for this example. And it can be, uh, there's nothing special about it, as far as I know. I doubt it. So I have other examples where it would be different numbers. Another question is, uh, do any of these relatively new results carry over into the sphere? The yeah, yeah, they're spherical packings. This, this, this theory is very general. So you can change the thing, and you, as long as you're making your group by uh, uh, inversions, geometric constructions, not all such constructions will preserve integrality. That, that, that's a, quite a miracle that Saudi found. It happens to be that the formula that you get there didn't have a square root in it. <laughs> Once you had all four of them, you never had to extract a radical. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> we like not to leave the integers. There are many examples with integers, and they're uh, very similar theorems. Uh, not as strong as this last Kontorovich. Uh, the the sieving theory is completely general. It's now understood completely generally. The local to global, except on a set of zero density, it requires some very special features of this, which are in my letter there to Ligarius. <laughs> so that's where these things are introduced and proved, like there's infinitely many primes. 
So there are special features of this Apollonian packing that I exploit in that letter that are exploited in some of the theorems. So not everything is general, let me be clear about that. Some things are not all. In particular, the Kontorovich O theorem, uh, the Kontorovich Bergen theorem that's being written now is extremely dependent on special features. That's special. Okay, so, uh, of course, it's nice to know what's general, what's special. Yeah. Any other questions? If one of yeah. those original three circles is a straight line, yes. does it make it easier? No. But you can talk about unbounded packings and there's a similar theorem. That's a very good question. This was a bounded packing that I did. And you can sort of localize into a bounded part. There are parts where there are certain packings which are more singular and much more complicated. But if, you, if, you, if the first one's a straight line and you look locally, it's the same. Uh, the, and in fact, that's a good thing to think about because making one of the circles a straight line, as you saw, the proof of Apollonius' theorem was to make two of them straight lines. And then it was plain. You didn't have to do anything. But once you start filling in all the circles, it's the same. And the easiest thing is to fixate on these ones which are bounded. So the minute one of them is a straight line, you know, or if two of them are straight lines and you're looking at everything in between, you, you, will, you will have an infinite packing, infinite region. And it's nice to fixate on the finite part if you want to count, because otherwise you have to artificially cut off. But it's, it's natural and it's a good question, and there, there's quite a bit written of, on, on non-finite packing. Yeah. Exactly what you're saying. Sadi was a chemist. Yes, a Nobel Prize have, winner. Did he have uh, other forays into... Uh, uh, I suspect his daughter was doing some homework problem. <laughs> <She's there. laughs> and he discovered this or something like that. And he fell in love with this. Now, you can... I could have read you the poem. I think it's rather bad. But, uh, he should have stuck to chemistry in this. <laughs> but uh, you will find his poem. So he, he really liked this. Uh, he was a nuclear chemist. He was a nuclear chemist? Yeah. Okay. I don't know what he did in chemistry, actually. But well, he was famous for his work on isotopes. Isotopes, OK. So I don't really know what got him into this, uh, but he did put it in nature. And uh, he was the first. It is interesting that he discovered the first Diophantine properties of this. I don't think anybody had realized this before. They probably were what I, the way I was talking. There's only one Apollonian packing. Why? You, where's this integer coming? I mean, it's very rare that you, you make constructions with radicals and that the each time you make it you're going to take a square root you think and you're not going to go into a new field and the point that he found was that once four of them once you pass this test on the fourth one which is my three coins the miracle is passed once there then forever you've passed the test and all the others are whole numbers it is a great discovery whether it deserves a poem I don't know <laughs>